Good morning. Welcome to the Monadnock Summer Lyceum. My name is Ben Taylor, and I will be the moderator for this morning's lecture. The Monadnock Summer Lyceum is held each summer Sunday in Peterborough, New Hampshire, at the Unitarian Universalist Church. For more information, please visit our website at www.monadnocklyceum.org. Our speaker today is Bill McKibben, the renowned environmentalist, journalist, and author who has written a dozen books on the environment, including The End of Nature, a 1989 tour de force and wake-up call about the threat to our planet from climate change. My connection to Bill is really through his father, Gordon, with whom I worked at the Boston Globe for many years and who was a remarkable newsman and a wonderful gentleman, two qualities that don't easily cohabitate in the newspaper business. It doesn't take a genius to see that Bill has inherited both of these qualities. He is highly regarded in his field, and even a cursory reading of his work shows that his prose cuts like a diamond. What I am most in awe of is how far he has moved beyond his journalistic roots. The fact that he was a staff writer for The New Yorker, a job most newspaper people would give their left arm for, and left that august position to do other things is extraordinary in and of itself. He became a remarkably successful author, a scholar in residence at Middlebury College, and an environmental activist who last year organized 2,000 demonstrations across the United States in a call to action on global warming. He now leads a global grassroots effort to solve the climate change problem. The website for this effort is 350.org. Bill's most recent books are Deep Economy and the Bill McKibben Reader. The title of today's talk is The Most Important Number in the World. Without further ado, it's a high honor and a distinct pleasure to introduce Bill McKibben. Ben. Ben. Ben, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thanks to all of you. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be up here in this high pulpit. My, um, I think I once heard my friend Peter Gomes, the great minister, refer to this position as being 10 feet above contradiction. Um, uh, I, I've spent my, um, you know, many of, most of my Sunday mornings of my life in church. I'm a... Uh, Methodist, but I never rose very high in the ecclesial hierarchy about the um, highest I ever have gotten is Sunday school, and at least in our tiny backwoods Methodist church, Sunday school teacher isn't a very highly qualified position. If you can take a tea towel on Christmas Eve and turn a, a fourth grader into a Palestinian shepherd, then you're, uh, <laughs> then you're in. But I think many Sunday school teachers, because we're down in the basement, you know, during the uh, service. We have a kind of pulpit envy, and that just goes to say that I may be here a while this morning enjoying this position. I really want to talk this morning about the global and the local, and how they intertwine with each other in this age that we find ourselves in, a very new and, and interesting and unsettling age. As Ben said, I wrote the first book about global warming, the most global of topics, 20 years ago now. But I wrote it really from the most local of perspectives from my life in the rural northeast. I, I was living then, as I have most of my adult life, over in the wilderness of the Adirondacks in upstate New York, way out in the woods and spending all my time out in the woods and in the mountains and on the lakes and deep in love as only someone in their probably in their mid-twenties, be just sort of head over heels in love with that wilderness. And what an unsettling feeling it was to read the first few scientific accounts of what we now call global warming, what we then called the greenhouse effect, and begin to understand that that wilderness that thrilled me so was not, or soon would not be quite as wild, in fact, in certain ways not wild at all, that the temperature was changing and with it the flora and the fauna and hence the very meaning of that place starting to shift in dramatic ways. Thoreau said once that he could walk a half hour from his house and come to a place where no man stood from one year to another and there 
Consequently, politics was not for politics was but the cigar smoke of a man. Uh, there were places where I know, where I don't think anyone's ever been, and yet politics is there now as our habits and our technologies and our appetites begin to change the very temperature of the earth, all those places come under a human purview. I spent the next 20 years, most of it, dealing with this question, with this topic, with this gathering challenge, the biggest thing that human beings have ever done. And I've gone from that very small scale out to the largest scales, gone to Bangladesh and watched as they had the first great outbreak of dengue fever uh, a few years ago, a mosquito-borne disease now spreading like wildfire around the developing world because the mosquito that spreads it is exquisitely sensitive to increases in temperature and humidity. They like the warmer, wetter world that we're building. And hence, the, the number of cases is going through the roof. I was actually had the fortune, in a sense, to be bitten by the wrong mosquito while I was there and come down with dengue myself, and it was as sick as I've ever been. But it gave me the opportunity to go spend the day at the huge central hospital in Dhaka and look out down the rows of hundreds and hundreds of people, many of them dying, hundreds of people in beds and hundreds of people in between the beds because there weren't enough, to reflect on the fact that they were responsible for essentially none of their plight. If you do the math, as the UN tries to do to figure out how much carbon each country on Earth emits, you can't even really get a value for Bangladesh. It's a rounding error. The 140 million people there are essentially off the grid. The bicycle rickshaw is the main form of transportation. And so it was sobering and chastening to look out around that hospital and realize that the 4% of us who live in this country produce 25% of the world's carbon dioxide, and that through some kind of, if not strictly accurate, math through some kind of powerful moral math that meant we were responsible for one bed in four in that vast assemblage there. I've had the chance to go to the Antarctic uh, and watch that most isolated and most beautiful of continents begins to crumble into the southern ocean. I've had the chance, in fact, if I seem a little fuzzy today, it's not just my usual fuzziness. I'm pretty much recently off the plane from China and still in the wrong time zone. I've had the chance to spend a lot of time in places like China and watch as they begin to try to emulate our approach to the world and with it begin to pour not American-sized quantities of, of carbon into the atmosphere. On a per capita basis, they'll never catch us. We'll remain the champions forever. But pour more and more and more carbon into the atmosphere. And to begin to sense the difficulty, almost the tragedy, of trying to deal with this problem in a world as unequal as the one that we've created. Over that 20 years, I've watched the hypothesis of global warming turn into a strong scientific consensus. And then, in the last year or two, watch that consensus, at least among scientists on the leading edge, turn in almost to a kind of panic as we begin to understand that this process is proceeding much more quickly and much more thoroughly than we guessed even a few years ago. You know, it's always been an experiment global warming, the largest experiment that we've ever conducted because we don't know exactly how it's going to come out. And we didn't know for a very long time where the danger line really was. Before the Industrial Revolution, the world's carbon concentration was about 275 parts per million. That's in the atmosphere how much carbon there was. And essentially for all of human history until 200 years ago, that's the value depending on your religious outlook, you could say that was the kind of Eden number. When we began burning coal and gas and oil and hence releasing carbon into the atmosphere, that number started to go up. But we didn't know how much was too much, even though we knew that global warming was a danger. And at first, the number that we tended to use as the kind of target to avoid if we possibly could was 550 parts per million. And the reason for that was not that we had any really good idea that that represented danger, merely that it represented a doubling of what used to be here. And hence, it was relatively easy to model with the relatively crude computer programs that people were using at the beginning. But like most numbers, it began to sort of seep into people's heads, maybe more than it should have. 
And a lot of policy work and things began to be geared around how we would keep carbon in the atmosphere below 550 parts per million. A few years ago, as it became clear, as we began to see just how quickly this storm was gathering, began to see that even by raising the temperature about one degree Fahrenheit, we'd been able to dramatically alter the hydrological cycle. Warm air takes up more water vapor than cold, so you see more evaporation and drought and a lot more of it now in arid areas. And once it's up there, it's going to come down. So we see a lot more deluge and downpour and flood in wet areas, lots and lots. And if you don't trust me, just go look at the record of insurance payouts around this world for the last decade and watch it climb exponentially as we begin to alter the weather in fundamental ways. As people began to take those kind of changes in mind, a kind of new Quasi red line began to emerge at about 450 parts per million. And some of the environmental groups and things a few years ago began to talk that way in the EU a little bit. Then, last summer, the Arctic melted in ways that hadn't been anticipated. The Arctic's been melting slowly, the sea ice in the Arctic, for the last 30 years, ever since we began to raise the temperature. And the minimum extent of sea ice has been. Uh, it's been dropping by about 2% a year or something like that. And it was quite noticeable from satellite pictures, you know. But last year, last year we went past the old record on August 16th for minimum sea ice, okay? And then for the next six weeks, until the long Arctic night finally descended in October and things began slowly to refreeze again, for six weeks we were losing an area of ice the size of California every week. It was just dropping off a cliff. It became increasingly clear that we had crossed a tipping point that we'd guessed at before but hadn't known quite where it was. That rapid melt, of course, is a graphic confirmation of the ways in which we're heating up the planet. There's no other explanation for why, for the first time in human history, the Northwest Passage was open for four weeks by the end of that spring. But it's also not just confirmation, but it's also a dangerous feedback loop on its own. You take the nice white covering that reflects 80% of incoming solar radiation off the top of the planet, and you replace it with blue water that absorbs 80% of that incoming solar radiation. It's indicative of the kind of feedback loops that we now begin to fear are coming very quickly into play. That human beings, having kicked off this reaction by pouring carbon into the atmosphere, are looking at a point, perhaps in the not too distant future, when the planet takes over this process of heating things up all by itself, you know, and where our moment for being able to do much about it begins to disappear. The rapid melt of sea ice is not the only indication that something like that is happening. Last year also saw a rapid increase in the amount of methane entering the atmosphere. Methane is another very potent greenhouse gas like carbon dioxide. The source for that methane entering the atmosphere almost certainly wasn't human. We've done a good job around the world in the last 10 years of plugging up leaks in natural gas pipelines and things like that. You can believe we've done it because as the price of natural gas has gone through the roof, it's become a great incentive to make sure that you're not just wasting some, okay? So the fact that the amount in the atmosphere was going up sharply last year seems to be the only plausible explanation that anyone can come up with is that as permafrost in the far north in the tundra in Siberia melts, there's a lot of methane stored beneath it, and that methane is now beginning to seep rather quickly into the atmosphere. In fact, there's uh, accounts now from scientists in Siberia in the last two winters describing even at the depth of the coldest part of the winter in the coldest place in the world uh, that, that there were open streams, open swamps, open ponds because the force of the bubbling of that methane up through the water was enough to keep them from freezing in the course of the winter. Dramatic change. Last December, Looking at that new real-time data and looking at the increasing amount of powerful paleoclimatic data, historic climate data that's been assembled over the last few years, a number of scientists led by our most important climatologist, James Hansen at NASA, the man who 20 years ago this June, testifying before Congress, was the first to publicly blow the whistle on global warming, Hansen et al. issued a new paper 
and finally gave us a number that seems rooted not in conjecture but in science. And that number, what I've been calling for the purposes of this lecture the most important number in the world, is 350. 350 parts per million carbon dioxide. His paper says that that is the most carbon that we can have in the atmosphere without endangering the conditions under which human civilization is able to maintain itself. It is a very tough number because we are already past it. We're at 387 parts per million CO2 and that value is rising about two parts per million per annum. So we are just like the person who goes to the doctor and after the checkup sits down for the consultation and is told your cholesterol is too high. You are in a zone of highly elevated risk. Are you to remain in this zone? Were you to remain in this zone? Your chances of having a heart attack or a stroke would be greatly amplified. You need to get out of this zone as fast as you can and hope that the heart attack or the stroke doesn't happen before you take the steps to do that. That's where we are as a planet except that the heart attack or the stroke is the rapid melt of ice above Greenland or the West Antarctic with catastrophic consequences for sea level rise. The heart attack or the stroke is the rapid shift of monsoonal rain patterns in the subcontinent or in Africa with incredibly devastating results for billions of people who depend on that rainfall for their daily bread. On and on and on. I want you to remember that number for the, the only thing you remember out of this talk, remember that number and I'll come back to it in a little while. Because I want to address the question of how it is that we might begin to go in the direction that we need to go. It is not going to be by any means easy and it will not happen quickly. But if we have any hope of ever getting back to 350 parts per million, it lies in ceasing to pour more carbon into the atmosphere, i.e. in ceasing to burn coal and gas and oil, i.e. in making the transition sooner rather than later away from fossil fuel and towards renewable sources of energy. Doing it much more quickly than is comfortable or easy or cheap. Doing it urgently. How are we going to go about doing it? Well, one of the answers, there are many answers and we can talk about them at some length and I'm not going to spend an immense amount of time talking about technology today, although we can in questions. But one of the answers, and one that I've spent a lot of time exploring in recent years, most recently in this book, Deep Economy, one of them is to start thinking about different scales of economic activity and different ways in which we might live. The last six months has been instructive. As the price of oil has sharply risen, We've begun to see some very interesting things happening for the first time in this country. For the first time pretty much since we invented the car, Americans are driving significantly fewer miles than they did. We'll drive at least 6% less this year than we did the year before. We're flying a lot less than we used to. The airlines are trying like crazy to shed routes, to park airplanes, to get rid of seats. Uh, there are estimates that there may be 20% fewer airplane seats flying next spring than this. Some of the big companies that worked, uh, United, which worked for years to win the rights to fly several new routes to China, just decided two weeks ago they didn't want to fly them after all. Um, they were going to turn them down. Northwest has been shedding much of its cargo business to Asia. On and on and on. We're even beginning to reverse the process that we've spent the last 20 years of doing, of, of relying on ever more distant places for our goods and services. Seven years ago, it cost about $3,000 to ship a container load of anything from Shanghai to the United States. With rising fuel prices, that $3,000 is closer to $20,000 now. There's essentially an 11% tariff that's been imposed on goods coming from Asia simply by the rising price of fuel. And one result is that we're beginning to see an uptick in manufacturing here close to home again. It's a very interesting development and not one that most people would have thought likely or possible even a couple of years ago. In essence, what I'm telling you is that Tom Friedman's formulation that we lived on a flat earth was correct, but only for a very short period of time. A period of time now passing and passing quickly. And then, in fact, we now live on what you might call an uphill planet. Wherever you are, 
it's uphill from there to every place else. Okay? And as the price of oil rises, that grade will get steadily steeper as the years go on. And frankly, I think there's a lot to be said for that, a lot to be said for it. This relocalizing economy, and I think this is a trend that will become more and more powerful, uh, is going to be one of the most interesting things that marks the next period in our history, and you can begin to see it happening already. For the last four or five years, for instance, think about the food economy in this country. The fastest growing part of it, even before oil began to get expensive, was local farmers' markets. Their numbers have doubled and then doubled again in the last decade. Sales growth is above 15%. They're growing faster, much faster than Walmart, you know. Not caught up yet, but going in the right direction. <laughs> and that's very good news in carbon terms. The system that we've set up for food, which seems logical and ordinary to us because we've lived with it most of our lives, is in fact viewed from any kind of distance quite odd. The average bite of food that we eat has traveled about 2,000 miles to reach our lips. That means essentially that it's been carefully marinated in crude oil. You know? <laughs> um, it also means, by the by, that it all tastes bad. I just got off the plane from China, and I know how I feel. That's how the tomato feels, you know? Uh, uh, uh. You can make the same argument for almost any commodity that you want to name, energy itself. Roof of my house is covered with solar panels, and they're tied into the grid. So on a sunny day, I'm a utility, firing electrons down to my... My neighbor is cooling his beer before the Red Sox game with the sunlight that falls on my shingles, okay? And that's a very nice alternative to our standard idea of centralized distribution and generation of everything. Nice for all kinds of reasons. One, it lets us employ more benign technologies like solar panels and windmills more easily. And if you had the good luck to have heard Al Gore's excellent speech the day before yesterday, a call for the rapid conversion to renewables in this country, this distributed generation was a big part of it. Also, it's a much more, in the end, I think, durable system than the one we have at the moment. Whatever you think of our energy system, laying aside its effect on global warming, you have to be a great optimist to believe that it's going to go on all that much longer. It is as jury-rigged as it's possible to imagine. Basically, it depends on figuring out how to defend the 5,000-mile-long straw to the Persian Gulf through which we suck hydrocarbons. Vermont, the state where I live, has lost more of its citizens to the war in Iraq than any state in the Union. We are very tired of going to funerals, okay? But we're going to be going to funerals for a long time, as long as the most important part of our economy lies under somebody else's sand. And it behooves us to figure out how to build a safer in every way approach. But here's the good part, the really good part, I think. It's that this kind of relocalizing community is not just more affordable in the age of high oil. It's not just that it's low carbon. The real virtue of it, most of all, may be that it's high community. And that's something we very much need. Here's the most interesting statistic about farmers' markets that I know. A few years ago, a pair of sociologists followed shoppers, first around the supermarket, then around the farmers' market. You all have been to the supermarket, and you know how it works. You walk in, you fall into a light fluorescent trance, you visit the stations of the cross around the supermarket, you emerge with the same basket of items somehow that you had the week before. Maybe you discuss paper or plastic on the way out the door. That's it. When they followed shoppers around the farmer's market, they found that they had on average 10 times more conversations per visit. An order of magnitude more, a whole different experience, and one that goes a long way towards starting to re-knit our communities back together. This emphasis on community is, I think, one of the most important things that we have to look at going forward. I just finished editing for the Library of America, this vast anthology called American Earth, about a thousand pages of environmental writing from Thoreau to the present. And it was a fascinating task, partly because it became very clear that the emphasis was shifting over that century and a half. At the beginning, under the influence of great men like John Muir, 
all the passion was behind the idea of wildness. And if you've never read Muir's accounts of the high country of Yosemite, that kind of ecstatic grammar of wildness, that vocabulary that was new to the world that he developed and that still serves as a kind of motive energy for so many of us. It's brilliant and wonderful. But in the middle of the last century, it began to acquire a, a companion idea, first with the great writer Aldo Leopold, writing about the nascent science of ecology, the understanding that all natural things were connected, and then adding into that the human element too, that our culture needed to be connected in some sensible way to the rest of things around us. And that sense of community and its importance is now, I think, the dominant strain in writing about the natural world. And the most important writer that we have on these topics is the great Kentucky farmer and essayist Wendell Berry, who has been the apostle of a renewed community for a very long time, and whose work is the most important work in my own thinking and development. Fossil fuel, cheap fossil fuel, made us too self-reliant. It allowed us to become hyper-individualistic in a way that no other representatives of our species have ever become. One way to say it is, cheap fossil fuel allowed us to become the first people in the history of the world who have no practical need of our neighbors for anything. And we've taken that to be a virtue, but as it turns out, it's, I think, been much more of a curse. One of the most interesting pieces of data that I've seen in a long time, and the one that got me launched on writing a uh, uh, book, Deep Economy, was from a pollster, one of the big national polling organizations, that's asked Americans every year since the end of World War II, are you happy with your life? The number of Americans, the percentage of Americans who say, I'm very happy with my life, peaked in 1956 and went steadily downhill since. Not much more than a quarter of Americans will currently claim to be very happy with their lives. Okay? Very strange that slight downward curve because over the same 50 years we've had a dramatic upward curve in our standard of living. It's almost trebled. And if there was the kind of correlation between more and better that we often naively assume, those two curves shouldn't be diverging quite like that. But they are, and the reason one should begin to look at the data is not all that hard to figure out. What did we start doing in the 1950s it was a real change. Well, basically, we took and have taken for the last 50 years until this winter's meltdown of our mortgage system, we've taken the American dream to mean building a bigger house farther apart from other people. That's where we've spent most of our economic might and power. Bigger houses farther apart from other people. That's had obvious ecological implications. You've got to heat and light and cool these things and drive between them and whatever. But it's also had, just as importantly, profound social implications. We run into each other a lot less in the course of a day. In the year 1900, the average American lived on an acre with eight other people. New subdivisions in the year 2000 had two people per acre. Just random sort of Brownian laws of motion indicate that you're less likely to see anyone, and in fact, that's what's happened. The average American eats meals with friends or family or neighbors half as often as they did 50 years ago. The average American has half as many close friends as they did 50 years ago. That is an enormous and despairing change. There are not enough iPods in the world to make up for losing half the friends that you would otherwise have had. Once this kind of change gets going, it acquires real momentum. And we've seen a lot of that. In fact, I think we've seen the zenith of it. This last, now ruinous housing boom will mark, in many ways, the, I think, the, the final resounding um, boom, you know, moment of that kind of absolute hyper-individualism. When that boom was at its height, a reporter for the New York Times in the real estate section asked an interesting question that I had wondered about, too. He wrote a story in inquiring into what was actually in those houses the size of junior high schools that kept appearing <laughs> everywhere. And, and the answer, it turned out to be, not just in the biggest, but in pretty much all the upscale, much of the upscale housing, the kind of, you know, starter castles for entry-level monarchs that were going up <laughs> all over the place. The answer turned out to be that many, many of these homes came with dual master bedrooms, okay? 
Husband snores, wife pulls off the blankets, answer to this dilemma is to add 800 square feet to the house, okay? That has obvious, again, ecological implications. There's 800 more square feet to heat or cool. It's kind of sad if you've spent much time in the rest of the world and know that in most of humanity, if you're lucky enough to have one bed in the house, there are three or four people sharing it and nobody is worrying about who's snoring. But it, it, bottom line, it was saddest just for the picture that it painted of what the richest people in the richest part of the world were all about, you know? That we had become so alienated from each other that we were now increasingly hunkering down in our own caves, staring out across the hall at our mates, you know? It was a sad picture. And so I think there is a great deal to be said for this transition that is coming, for the world that we will need to build and I think increasingly want to build that will be richer and deeper in community, more local and more sweet. And in many ways, it makes me greatly optimistic to think about those possibilities. And I probably should stop there. Okay? But I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm not going to because we have a huge problem which is that we have a very short period of time in order to make this transition to a lower energy, renewable energy kind of world. If we're going to head off the worst and most cataclysmic effects of global warming, which I will not bother trying to list for you today. Such a short period of time, such a few years, that in many ways, it turns the normal process, political or practical response upside down. We're used to thinking that if we have a problem like this, we should start small and do the obvious and necessary things and slowly build up, and that makes a lot of sense. In which case, you know, the best first response to global warming would be doing something like changing all the light bulbs in your house to compact fluorescence, which actually is a very good idea, and probably most of you have done it. We did it, you know, years ago. But in the world in which we live at the moment, where we have to make this unbelievably massive change in very short order, something curious happens. The practical becomes oddly symbolic. If you stop and think about it, you know that we cannot solve this problem one light bulb at a time and then one hybrid vehicle at a time and one individual kind of conversion to the need to do these things at a time. There is not time for that to happen. What we need is rapid change at the very top, at the national and the global scale, and national and then international compact agreement protocol to set a real price on carbon that reflects the damage that it does in the atmosphere. And then we have to hope that markets will work as well as they're supposed to, to spread that piece of information very quickly throughout the economic system of the entire world and cause all of us, corporations and individuals, to make the changes that we need to make in the time that we have to make them. And there's some hope to think that that will happen. I mean, it was very impressive this year to watch what a dollar on the price of gasoline meant in terms of human behavior. Environmentalists, including me, have spent a long time making the case for the last 15 or 20 years against the SUV, you know? And we were somewhat effective. Over time, we changed the moral valence, and you know, finally they hit a... But nothing like what happened in two months this year when the SUV went from becoming a status symbol to becoming a planter, you know? I, I mean, <laughs> uh, there is nobody in this country who wants an SUV now. I drove past the other day a Winnebago dealership, and I thought, man, that is the unluckiest guy in all of America. You know, who is ever going to buy one of those again? Uh, you know, that is so over. Because we need that large-scale political change, we need to build a movement, and we need to build it quickly. That is to say, we need symbolic action more than we need practical action. Symbolic action that can build the political power to force that kind of change. I talk about this as if I know an enormous amount about how to bring about political change. And I don't really. I'm not an experienced activist exactly. I'm a writer. Writers, by definition, are people who like to sit in their rooms and write, you know? And so it takes a little while for us 
to uh, rouse ourselves, and indeed it took quite a while for me to rouse myself. i had been writing and speaking about global warming for 18 years, but two summers ago I decided finally that I had to do something more. Everybody had seen Al Gore's movie, Hurricane Katrina had blown through, still nothing was happening on a national or international scale, and so I said, I've got to do something. But I didn't know what to do. I'm a writer, I live in Vermont, I called up a few other writers I knew, said, look, we got to go up to, we'll go up to uh, Burlington and we'll sit in on the steps of the federal building and we'll get arrested, there'll be a little story in the paper, at least we will have done something, you know. And, 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 and the other, other writers, that writer, clueless, oh, that sounds good, we'll do that, you know. Um, but somebody called up to Burlington and asked the police department, what would happen were we to do this? And the police department said, nothing will happen. Um, <laughs> stay there as long as you want, we'll come visit. <laughs> and so we had to recalibrate. And uh, I started sending out emails to all my friends, just saying, we're going to go on a pilgrimage, okay? Will you join us? And two weeks later, we left. We left from Robert Frost's old summer writing cabin in the Green Mountains, because we liked that most cliched of all high school English class poems about the road not taken, you know, it seemed apropos. And so for five days we marched and we would sleep in fields at night and do programs in churches in the evening and things, and by the time we got to Burlington, there was a thousand people marching, okay, which in Vermont is an enormous horde of people, a scary collection of people. <laughs> And it was more than enough to get all of our people who were running, this was two years ago, for Congress and Senate to come down and meet with us, okay? And it was so exciting to, um, to, to see them all there and to see them get up on stage and sign this petition, the, this pledge that said they would work to reduce carbon emissions 80% by 2050, okay? That was a radical idea at the time, endorsed only by scientists, you know, not by politicians. But all of them signed, including the conservative Republicans. The woman who had been running for Congress on the GOP ticket had said two months before when she announced for office, I'm not sure that, that this global warming thing is real. More research needs to be done. The more research that needed to be done was how many people were going to walk across Vermont and ask her to change her mind. And empirically, a thousand was enough because she signed, okay? <laughs> the only depressing part of this story was to open the paper the next day and see this story that said that thousand people might have been the largest demonstration that had yet taken place in the country about climate change it made me realize that we had really needed to build a movement to make change, okay? And so that's what we set about doing, or trying. Last January, 07, we opened this website called Step It Up 07, and we asked people, I just started sending out emails again, asking people all around the country, will you organize a little demonstration in April to demand this same 80% goal? And we didn't have any money, we didn't have any organization behind this or anything, so we had you know, we secretly hoped, the six of us who were doing this, me and five Middlebury College students, that we might organize a hundred demonstrations over the course of that winter. But instead, it just took off virally. And because of people in this room and people like them all over the country, people like Gail Denmark down here from Amherst, or people like Granny D, of course, or people everywhere, turned into a huge thing. On that April day, there were 1,400 demonstrations in all 50 states. It was the biggest day of grassroots environmental action since Earth Day in 1970. All organized for no money, just for people's willingness to come together. Not only was it beautiful, it was effective. Within the week of those demonstrations, both Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama took that 80% by 2050 goal as the centerpiece of their energy and environment platforms. That was a big change. We moved them a long ways by showing that there was a real constituency. And I think that there finally is going to be something good happen in this country. We're finally going to take the first steps, and I hope there'll be pretty big steps next year to doing something about this when we have a new president. If we do that, it will only be one half the battle. In fact, considerably less than one half. They don't call it global warming for nothing. We need the same kind of grassroots movement here and around the world. In December of 2009, the world's leaders will meet in Copenhagen, in Denmark, to agree on the follow-up to the Kyoto Treaty. The science now lets us know that unless that is a very ambitious and strong and powerful agreement, that the hope of ever getting back to 350 is gone forever.
So that meeting becomes extraordinarily important. Were it held today, it would be a disaster because there is no huge groundswell there for doing what needs to be done. So we've, the same small crew of us, have launched in the last month or so a kind of international version of this campaign at 350.org, 350.org, which I hope you will go and visit. And its point is to spend the next 18 months figuring out ways to make that number ubiquitous around the world, to make it so that if people know nothing else about climate change, they know that that number represents some kind of safety. And if we can make it widely enough known, then it will have somewhat the same psychological effect that that 80% by 2050 mark did. It will begin to shift those negotiations in the direction of the science. Probably not all the way there, but at least we'll get a long ways further than we would have otherwise. At least the planet will know what its reality is, what the physics and the chemistry dictate. How do you do make a number ubiquitous? I don't really know yet. You know, a global campaign isn't easy. Among other things, people all over the world insist on speaking a wide variety of different languages. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons that 350 is such a useful thing. Only Arabic numerals and musical notation easily cross linguistic borders, okay? So 350 becomes very important. If you go to the website, you will see a quite beautiful 90-second animated video that manages without any words at all to explain what it is we're doing. And as people see that, they're beginning to respond to the challenge of how to take those numbers and creatively bring them to everyone's understanding. We have seen in the last few weeks, just since we've begun, all kinds of spontaneous and beautiful actions that we're able to spread around the globe. We've seen 350 bicyclists in Salt Lake City circling the State House, and a big story in the paper, and we were able to spread it. We have seen, I opened the email the other day, and there was an email, a photo from a farmer in a village in Cameroon in Africa, and their village had somehow heard about this because everybody now has a cell phone someplace in the village, every place around the world, and they had planted 350 trees on the edge of the village and a little sign on them explaining what they were doing. Just to the south of the border here in Massachusetts, the United Church of Christ and the Episcopalians have pledged that before the year is out, they will have had 350 churches that will have rung their church bells 350 times at some point in the course of the year. And the first few have done it, and it's gone just as I would have expected. There is no radio or TV station that can resist going out to cover you know, a church bell ringing 350 times. So that is spreading now quickly into other faith communities. And I hope that you will do just the same kind of things here across New Hampshire for the next year or so. At the end of next year, we're going to have a national, sometime before that meeting in Copenhagen, an international day of action with demonstrations all over the place. But we need lots of these creative ideas leading up to it. I'm going to end there. End with the great hope that some significant percentage of you will decide to take real action. This is the most important question of our time, and it demands action the same way that the civil rights movement did, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. And it demands the same kind of action, morally urgent, passionate, willing to sacrifice, all those sort of things. I can't promise you that it's all going to work out in the end. The momentum of the physics and chemistry are daunting indeed. The name of the book that I wrote about all of this 20 years ago, 20 years ago, was The End of Nature. So I'm not, you know, unbelievably optimistic all the time. But I am extraordinarily moved, extraordinarily moved in the last couple of years by watching people first around this country and now around this world come together in defense of the one planet that we have, the one planet that we were born onto, the one planet that we are called to defend at this time in our history as a species. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. While you were speaking, I counted the audience in the, the church today, and I counted 350 right on the nose. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Good work, you all. Again, for our radio audience, uh, you are listening to the Monadnock Summer Lyceum in Peterborough, New Hampshire. Our speaker today is Bill McKibben, talking about what to do about climate change.
while the ushers gather questions from our audience, I'd like to ask the first one. Uh, you mentioned uh, Al Gore's speech last week. Maybe you could expound on that a little bit about uh, the 10-year commitment to switch from fossil fuels to renewables to power our electrical needs. Sure. Al Gore gave a beautiful speech the other day in which he laid out an ambitious goal. All electricity in this country to come from non-carbon sources within a decade. That is an enormous reach. It is at least as ambitious as the Apollo project of the 1960s. And it's most notable for its reach. I have no doubt that were we actually to set a goal like that and to set aside the resources or some of them required to meet it, that we would do so. And I think that the challenge lies in overcoming the enormous amount of both vested interest and inertia on all of our parts that he makes that seem so unlikely. It's fundamentally a political challenge. And one of the things that's best about it, and will be best about what happens after January in this country, is that the rest of the world would see that America is finally beginning to wake up to its obligation to do something. It is not impossible to imagine the Chinese or the Indians joining in some kind of agreement. It's much more difficult for them because they're still poor, but they're also rational and realize that they're real problems. But the first step and the first big step is clearly going to have to come from the country that for a hundred years has been pouring carbon into the atmosphere. And if we're not able to make something bold and powerful, some statement, then the chance of anybody else stepping up that matters in the developing world is small. Lots of questions. Here in New Hampshire, wood is local and renewable resource. What is the impact on the atmosphere of burning wood for heat? Good question. You're going to see, a, I think in northern New England, we're going to see a large shift towards wood in the years to come because of price uh, more than anything else. We're already starting to see it. And that's a double-edged sword. You know, we don't want to see another deforestation of New England. And there are lots of local air pollution problems, of course, that'll come if everybody starts using wood boilers all the time. On the other hand, in carbon terms, it makes real sense. You produce carbon when you burn wood, but theoretically, in any good forestry scenario, the tree will regrow and there's a tree will grow in the same spot, soaking up that carbon. That carbon's already up on the face surface of the earth in this cycle. It's not buried safely below the way that fossil fuel is. So a good thing, especially at the higher tech end. At Middlebury College, we've just put together, we've just changed one of our two boilers from oil to wood chips, and now we're quickly figuring out how to grow the wood on abandoned agricultural land down in the Champlain Valley with fast-growing willows that are providing new conservation habitat for species and that are soaking up uh, excess nutrients from all those years of running cows on that land that would otherwise soak into Lake Champlain. We've got to look for those kind of win-win scenarios every place we can. The danger of rushing quickly into things is exemplified by what's happened with ethanol, something, a mistake we'd be wise to try to outthink before we make the next one. Can you get George Soros to pay to air the 350 video on TV? <laughs> In fact, it's quite amazing to see how people step up within a a couple of weeks of launching this, we heard from these people in Europe, Swedes, and they said, uh, we're going to run a series of full-page newspaper ads. And they ran them in the New York Times, in the International Herald Tribune, and the Financial Times. And they rounded up all these VIPs to sign them. And it was quite amazing. The only price was that I had to go to Sweden to uh, you know, meet with them. And it was great fun. We had, had dinner with Kofi Annan and King, my new friend, King Gustav of Sweden. And we discussed 350, and it was all great fun. That's the kind of serendipity that we're counting on happening. The only too great. We had the money to do that kind of thing. I think more important is the kind of grassroots local action that builds real power. And since Granny D is sitting down front, I mean, New Hampshire has no story better to tell than the story of her walk across the country and the way in which, for a remarkably small expenditure in monetary terms, if quite high in, uh, you know, uh, calories and blisters, it produced, you know, an amazing bonanza of media, of introspection, of thought and action. And those are just the kind of examples that we need around the country. Please speak about cap and dividend, or tax and dividend, sure. as a way to, sure. to spur energy conservation and development of alternatives. Sure. Okay, here are the problems. We've got to cap the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere. 
in essence, we've got to put a limit on it and begin to ratchet that limit down. The effect of that will be to make fossil fuel more expensive. That's how it'll work. That's why we'll drive less or build smaller houses or things. But it's unlikely to be politically popular, just my guess. So we've got to figure out a way to make it politically palatable. The best of these solutions is that I've seen so far, and it's beginning to gain real traction in Congress, is to put a limit on carbon, it goes down each year, and then auction the permit to produce that emission. So ExxonMobil or Peabody Coal or whatever has to buy permits each year to release the CO2. They're going to pass the cost on to the consumers. So you take the money generated by that auction, and it'll be a lot of money, and you write everybody in the country a check every month, more or less making them whole against the rise in the price of energy that would come. In fact, the more frugal you are, the better you would do under this system. You'd be you know, getting some pay for somebody else's waste, in a sense. You could make it fairly progressive so that it benefited poor and middle class people the most. And I think it's probably the only kind of solution that's going to allow us the political will to continue for a long time the fight against carbon. Is the scientist Lovelock correct? Are we in fact doomed? Is it too late? You know, in one sense, the sun is going to blow up in a billion years anyways. Viewed in a long enough time scale, we're, we're in big trouble. Look, the, the short answer is we don't know. You can make a reasonable argument, as Jim Lovelock did in his book, Revenge of Gaia, that, or Gaia's Revenge or something, that we've gone too far already and we've pushed this system past the point that it can recover spontaneously. And we're clearly quite close. The most ominous sign is the rapid destabilization of the great ice sheets above Greenland and the West Antarctic, which we used to believe had so much mass that it would take a very long time to melt them, and that therefore we had a few centuries before they would contribute enormous amounts to sea level rise. We now understand that that process is much more dynamic, that instead of just melting slowly down, as the top layer melts, a lot of water is finding its way in these huge moulins, meltwater tunnels, to the bottom of those glaciers, and that's greasing the skids for their slide into the ocean. Greenland has enough ice that it alone raises the world sea level about 25 feet if it melts. We used to think that was a process of many centuries. Jim Hansen testified in federal court last year in a case brought by Detroit in its endless desire to keep from raising mileage requirements. He testified that it was now quite plausible that unless we acted swiftly, we could see a sea level rise as high as six meters, 18 feet, before the century was out. Okay? That's ominous news if anything, even like a tiny fraction of that happens. That's why this next few years is so crucial. The window is clearly narrow. The best science would indicate it isn't closed yet. Have you heard of transition towns? Could you speak about this? Could Peterborough become a transition town? Transition town movement began in England in the last few years. Uh, the first one is a town called Totnes in Cornwall. There are people doing planning for this transition away from fossil fuel and towards a much more localized economy. And there are people in this country doing similar kinds of things, some called transition towns or some called peak oil planning and, you, you know, that kind of thing. And you can see good examples now on the web of that starting to happen. And, you know, any, uh, anything we can do to relocalize economies is a very useful step. But, as I said before, the most effective, the most necessary thing to do with at least a little bit of your time and energy, along with planning the farmer's market, is figuring out how to do something, perhaps in collaboration with 350.org, to change the ground rules at the top level. Because if we're able to, then every town will find itself becoming a transition town without having to build local political structure everywhere. The mere economic logic of it will begin to force that change. And I think, given the time that we have, that that's going to be necessary to do it at that level, too. What is your opinion of a Manhattan-type project to increase the use of nuclear energy? I think nuclear energy is unlikely to be a huge part of this solution. And the main reason is not the safety cost, though that's always going to be there. You know, those of us in this part of the world are ever more acutely aware of it when we watch chunks fall off of Vermont Yankee every few weeks and things. It's sort of sobering. But the real cost, the real reason, is that there's too high an opportunity cost. 
nuclear power plant is enormously expensive. At the moment, with the rise in the price of concrete and piping and things, it's six or seven billion dollars, okay? Give me six or seven billion dollars and I'll show you 20 ways that you can get a lot more carbon bang for the buck a lot quicker. I think one of the reasons that there's a certain reason to leave some of these, once you've set strong political goals, to leave some of the decision making to markets instead of to Congress is that the market is unlikely to make mistakes of an enormous magnitude. It would never have gone down the route of corn-based ethanol without massive government subsidy, and I doubt it'll go down the route of huge nuclear build-out without massive government subsidy. I think we'll find the things that are cheapest first, and given that we have limited resources, especially after spending a trillion or so dollars on the war in Iraq, we'd be well advised to find the cheapest ways that we can. We have time for one more question. For the most part, you're preaching to the choir today. How do we individually convince the skeptics? Don't worry too much about the skeptics. 70% of polling shows that 70% of Americans understand that global warming is a real and serious problem. 70% is a lot to get to agree to anything in this country. I mean, 50% of Americans believe that Elvis is alive. So, you know, 70% on this is a good start. The thing always to bear in mind is that change in a democracy doesn't require 51% of people, okay? It requires 5% of people becoming actively involved. And if that happens, there's not a political system in this country that won't yield real change. I don't worry about preaching to the choir because the choir is reasonably large. I worry about the choir not singing loudly enough. And that's what we need. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. You've given us a lot to think about. Once again, you've been listening to the Monadnock Summer Lyceum in Peterborough, New Hampshire. Join us next week when author and musician John Gould talks about the importance of the Beatles and popular music in times of trouble. Now, for those in the live audience, please join us for our reception in the Parish Hall. Today's reception is being hosted by the Harris Center, which also provided the flowers.